A very good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all of you, depending on which time zone you have logged in from. And welcome to Aqua Talks, a webinar series brought to you by Maitri Aquatech, a company formed under the Make in India initiative, which has developed the sustainable technology to generate clean, healthy, mineral enriched portable water from the air. This webinar series Aqua Talks is a platform for knowledge sharing on water related issues by experts from industry, government and academia. The topic for the first episode is water and future challenges. And we have a very distinguished panel of experts to share the thoughts on this subject. Post which we will have the Q&A session. The panel is comprised of Mr. Suhas Joshi, Head Sustainability and Business Stewardship, South Asia at the Bayer Group. Professor Brahma Chalani, a visionary who has written nine books, two of which are on water. In fact, his first book was written over a decade ago. And we have our very own Mr. Richard Reiki, co-founder of Maitri Aquatech and former chief executive of KPMG India. Yeah, so I'd like to first uh, request Mr. Suhas Joshi to share his words, a few words on the topic. But before that, let me just give us an uh, introduction on him. Uh, Mr. Suhas Joshi, besides being the head of sustainability and business stewardship, South Asia at Bayer Group, has co-founded Drought Action Network, comprising representation from private sector, governments, and institutions, in order to bring about thought leadership, support evidence-based policy making, and back science-based programs to sustainably elevate the water stress that perennially affects agriculture in many parts of the country. So Haas has played a key role in setting Bayer's South Asia-specific sustainable development strategy, leading successful projects, sustainable development reporting as per GRI guidelines. His focus was to ensure that Bayer's sustainability approach remains centered on developing innovative strength and enable to generate economic, ecological, social benefits and responsible business practices. He's also set up the Bayer Foundation in India with years of experience of managing political issues and solving unprecedented crisis. Suhas is a leader known for achieving success. I request Mr. Suhas to please uh, say a few words on the topic. Thank you. Uh, Nabeen, good afternoon to you and uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, it's my privilege and a pleasure to be speaking at this August forum. And for this, I would be thankful to Richard and Naveen for this opportunity. I also look forward to Professor Brahma's insights in this topic. Look forward to a discussion with him as well as with the members of the audience. Gentlemen, let me take you back to 108 years ago in 1912. A gigantic ship started its journey from Southampton to New York. The largest ship afloat of its time, this RMS Titanic, now you know, all of you know this, struck an iceberg in North Atlantic Ocean and sank along with 1,500 plus passengers. It was in tragedy of the century. Now the iceberg that sank Titanic came into existence for more than 3,000 years. And like any other iceberg, 
the one tenth of it was visible above the surface and the nine tenth, the nine parts of that iceberg out of 10 were invisible lying below the surface. Now I stop the story here. I will park this story here and come back to this after a while. Let's get back to the main topic of today's discussion, water and future challenges. And to analyze this better, let's see the bigger picture and try to dig a little bit deeper into this topic. Now, water availability in India, the per capita availability is approximately less than 1500 cubic meters per year. And as per the UN definition, 1500 or less is a region or a country which is water stressed. The situation is worsening every year. And last year, I believe the availability was estimated to be around 1300 plus cubic kilometers per capita. So sooner we will be below dropping below 1000 cubic meters per capita availability of water. And that would mean that we will be officially a water scarce country. So this is the direction we are heading towards. Now let's do some numbers to put this situation in a right perspective. The country's annual availability of utilizable water is estimated to be around 1100 to 1200 cubic kilometers. And out of this 1200, 80% is withdrawn by agriculture. So the rest 20% is divided between industrial use and the domestic consumption. Now for the sake of simplicity of discussion, analysis and calculation, let's assume that the overall availability of utilizable water in our country is around 1000 cubic kilometers that makes a easier number to deal with. And the agriculture consumes around 80% of that. So that is 800 cubic kilometers of water is consumed by the irrigation requirement of the crops. And around 200 cubic kilometer is available for industrial and domestic use. So we have now three key segments in which the water use is divided. 10% domestic, again, a big number. There could be slight variations uh, across these sources, but let's take 10%. 10% for industrial use and 80% for agriculture. Now, if we look into the first segment that is 10% domestic use, the, it's, the number itself is so small. If you try to influence the water use efficiency in this segment that is consuming hardly 100 cubic kilometers of water, and if you are successfully able to reduce the consumption say by 10%. That would mean you are hardly saving 10 cubic kilometers of water, which is negligible. And the possibility of water saving here is also quite difficult because this is the segment which has been underserved so far. The domestic sector, the families, the population, the access to piped water was very limited. And also access to other sources of water was very difficult. Many villages travel kilometers to fetch the water for domestic use. So this 10 cubic kilometers is a number coming from an underserved segment. It is suboptimal. As the Jal Shakti Ministry starts implementing the Sarvajal Abhiyan and the access to uh, the piped water improves, this 10 cubic kilometer number will significantly change. This factor will drive the consumption drastically. And at the same time, as the population grows, this segment 
will not limit itself to 10 cubic kilometers. So there is very limited possibility of influencing this segment for any future strategies. Now, if we take the second segment, the industrial use, very simple, every year if our uh, economy grows by five, six percent, uh, notwithstanding COVID setback, the use of water here will continue to grow. If uh, the water doesn't remain available for this segment, then there will be drag on our economy. So there is nothing much one can do here, even if the if the industry improves the water consumption by 10%, hardly we are saving 10 cubic kilometers of water here. That makes no difference whatsoever. So the elephant in the room is agriculture. Now water is the real fuel for this sector's growth. Without water, there is no cropping, there is no agriculture. However, the situation is so bad that while 50% of the agriculture is still not irrigated, they don't have enough water even to cultivate one full crop, the another 50% gets drenched in the water that is more than necessary, ultimately damaging the soil and reducing the productivity. We are the country of contradictions, aren't we? One side there is excess water, one side there is no water. Now, this is the sector which gives us space to maneuver. Because 800 cubic kilometers, even a small impact, 5 to 10%, of the 10% reduction in water consumption, we would be freeing up around 80 cubic kilometers of water, that is our yearly requirement for domestic consumption almost. Sounds nice on paper, but easier said than done. Otherwise, by now, the governments would have definitely done something about it. Let's dig a bit further here. Let's dig a little bit deeper on this topic. Now, as we know, we are a water-stressed country. And despite being a country with very limited access to water, we grow one of the most water inefficient crop occupying largest cultivable land area. 44 million hectares of rice in the country, a crop that consumes around 4 thousand liters of water per kg of grain production. Simple back of the envelope calculation, we produce around 100, and 100 million tons or 110 million tons every year. And 4,000 liters per kg would mean this crop consumes 400 cubic kilometers of water per year. This is around 50% of the total water withdrawn by the agricultural sector. And once the domestic consumption is taken care of uh, for the rice grains, that requirement is around say 100 million tons the rest, around 10 million tons, we export to other countries. And uh, we earn around, say, 5 billion USD approximately for an exchange for these exports. So let's see the interesting part here. We export 10 million tons. That would mean we are exporting 40 cubic kilometers of water every year to other countries earning hardly 5 billion USD. 40 cubic kilometers is half of our industrial requirement that we are exporting to other countries. Since there is no value attached to the water, we don't know how much actual va uh, 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 value in terms of uh, water we are exporting. And at the same time, we import 
around 15 million metric tons of edible oil every year, costing us around 10 billion USD. And the oil seed crop, the edible oil, the crop where it comes from, that consumes even less than one fourth of water to produce. So again, let's see the contradiction. On one side, we are exporting 40 cubic kilometers of water. We are producing a crop which is highly water inefficient. And we are exporting this for 5 billion USD. At the same time, we are importing some material uh, at 10 billion USD approximately that could have produced in the country had we replaced some rice uh, acreage by oil seed consuming less than one fourth of the water. So this is a contradiction we are living in. What are the reasons perhaps policy, the procurement policies and many more things, the agricultural systems established in the North that could be a topic of a different discussion, but I'm just flagging this uh, issue here. Now let's go back to the story of the iceberg, the iceberg that sank Titanic. Just like iceberg, the water crisis is no different. One tenth is visible above the ground and nine tenth is below the surface, below the soil to be exact and uh, to use the <coughs> right expression. The excess water used in agriculture in some of these crops, large crops, the inefficient irrigation practices, the excessive tillage has cause serious damage to the soil below the surface. And when we say the soil is damaged, the very measurable parameter here is the soil organic carbon content, which is on average around 0.3 to 0.5% across the country against the desired level of one to 1.5%. 1 now, how does this affect? And this is worsening year by year. So if we talk about the future scenario, if this is not reversed, in future, the carbon content would be reducing further because we are not changing. So when the soil organic carbon, the, the percentage are reduced, the water holding capacity and also water drainage capacity, both water holding and water drainage capacity of the soil declines that gets affected. So in unnecessary places, we can find water accumulation where we don't need water. And in places where we need some water, soil water, since the soil carbon is very low, the water gets, uh, gets drained to some other place. So this is double whammy. If the carbon improves, the soil carbon improves, the water retention in the places where the root system needs the water will improve. And so our overall agricultural water requirement would decline and huge quantum can be freed up for our industrial as well as for our domestic use. So this is something, a very serious issue below the surface line. And this affects almost nine tenth of the water crisis in our country. So this is the big picture about the crisis that is affecting us. Gentlemen, this, is, this crisis is a, a complex phenomenon. It's not very one, uh, it doesn't get driven by one factor or just one issue. That's very difficult to monitor and define. Uh, if we compare it with any other disaster or any other calamity, we are dealing with a very unique animal here. For example, some disaster like hurricane, there would be a definite beginning and a definite end. We would know when the hurricane is starting and when it is ending. 
so uh, before that we might get some uh, some alert from the med department or the appropriate department we can prepare and then after a while it goes away we can rebuild everything but on the other hand this water crisis which is developing is a creeping phenomenon that slowly sneaks up and impacts many sectors of the economy and operates at the many different levels and scales this is just like diabetes a chronic disease it develops over a time gradually becomes difficult to cure and it becomes visible only after a particular threshold is crossed by that time the damage is done same with the water crisis we start seeing the visible impact only when the the water availability reduces beyond a particular point and all the factors affecting that go beyond our control it becomes very difficult to reverse and such chronic diseases can be dealt with or possibly cured only through a hard proactive and integrated approach just working on one factor or just the surface water availability or just the surf, uh, supply side factors working on that it's not going to help if we we have to control the diabetes we need to do diet control we need to make lifestyle changes we need to take medication and a number of things same thing will be here we need to change our agricultural systems we need to change our uh, irrigation patterns we need to change the procurement policies and at the same time also build water structures optimal water structures also improve the supply side situation and everything has to be done together and this needs courageous decision making political will and timely proactive actions uh, without this we are moving towards a direction which doesn't look very positive so i pause here and uh, in the uh, second part of the the discussion look forward to more questions uh, more question answers thank you thank you very much uh, thank you very much sohas on your insights on this topic clearly the problem is grow huge and growing with every passing year and what makes matters worse is we are also exporting water which is extremely dangerous for a country like ours which is already tremendously water stressed now we move on to our next expert speaker uh, i take immense pleasure in introducing professor brahma chalani professor brahma chalani is a geo strategist and author he is presently a professor of strategic studies at the independent center for policy research in new delhi a richard von winsacker fellow and robert boss academy in berlin a trustee of the national book trust and an affiliate with the international center for the study of radicalization at king's college london he has served as a member of the policy advisory group headed by the foreign minister of india as a specialist on international strategic issues he held appointments at harvard university the brooklyn institution the paul h nets school of advanced international studies at john hopkins university the australian national university and the noble institute at oslo he has written nine books of which two are been written on water he is the author of one of the uh, international best sellers in water asia's new battleground which is also the winner of bernard swords award in addition to being a strategic thinker and author Professor Brahma is also a columnist and commentator, including for Project Syndicate. His opinion articles appear in Nikki India, Asia, sorry, uh, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, The Guardian, Times of India, The Japan Times, The Globe, and The Mail. Uh, Professor Brahma is a well-known face, and he is very often appeared on CNN, BBC, and others. May I please invite Professor Brahma to share a few words on the topic? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Mathur. Uh, following on uh, what uh, Mr. Swas Joshi mentioned, what I intend to do is to provide the larger view. I'm going to provide the global view so that we can understand the India situation 
in the larger context. Water has become the world's most exploited natural resource, leading to shortages in about two thirds of the world. Yet, paradoxically, water remains the world's most underappreciated, undervalued, and underpriced resource. We all know that water is a renewable resource, but we should also understand that water is a finite resource. Why is water a finite resource? Because nature has a fixed capacity to replenish water every year. And that fixed capacity is about 43,000 billion cubic meters per year. That's the maximum theoretical amount of water that nature can replenish every year under natural conditions, excluding human influence and the effects of climate change. Water is actually a unique natural resource. It's unique in the sense that there's, other, there's no other natural resource that matches water. Let me begin with a simple truth. We can all live without love, but not without water. Isn't that true? There are substitutes for a number of other natural resources. For example, oil. You can substitute oil with something else, including electricity but there's no substitute for water. We cannot replace water with anything else. Countries can import, even from distant lands, fossil fuels, mineral ores, and resources from the biosphere, like many countries too, India too, buys, imports fossil fuels, mineral ores from Latin America, Africa, from Australia, etc. But countries cannot import the most vital of all resources, water, certainly not in a major or lasting manner. Water is essentially local because it's heavier than oil and very expensive to ship water across seas. To be sure, some countries have tried to import water. For example, in 2008, a severe drought forced Spain's Barcelona region to import water from France through tankers. But the import proved so expensive, it cost millions of euros or about three US dollars per cubic meter. But the government of Catalonia province decided to invest in building desalination plants to meet future water needs. The present COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of water. Water is central to fighting any pandemic or even a localized outbreak of a disease. Unclean water, in fact, is the greatest killer on the globe, claiming thousands of children's lives every day, every day. This is a reminder that water is a life preserver but it can also be a life destroyer when it becomes a carrier of deadly bacteria or takes the form of tsunamis, flash floods, storms, and hurricanes. Many of the greatest natural disasters of our times have been water related. Fukushima is one of the more recent examples. Now, let me take you through some slides quickly in order to present the larger global picture. Let me just um, share these slides. Water resources are very unevenly and unequally distributed across the world. As you can see from this chart, Asia is the world's most water stressed continent. Some regions and some countries are water rich. For example, if you look at this um, particular slide, you can see, um, one minute. Um, 
Yes, you, you can see on this slide that Canada and, and Brazil in particular are very water rich. These two countries are the Saudi Arabia's of the freshwater world. But two thirds of the world faces water stress today. Now, if you look at this particular map, this map tells you areas of water stress at present. The yellow areas represent extreme water stress and the dark blue areas represent high water stress. As you can see, much of India is already suffering from extreme water stress or high water stress. That is today. If you look, if you were to think of what will happen 20 years from now, the situation will become much worse. The poorest countries in water resources, however, are largely located in the Islamic arc that stretches from the Maghreb and the Sahel to the Arabian Sea region. These are the countries that are the most water scarce countries in the world. Water availability in these countries that you see on the chart is just a fraction of 1% of the availability in Canada or Brazil or Russia. Another important aspect about water is that much of the world's water is a shared resource. It is shared between countries and between provinces. This map illustrates cross-border river flows in just one part of the world. The arrows show the direction in which the water flows and the figures represent the total yearly flows in cubic kilometers. Shared water resources have particularly become a source of increasing competition and conflict between countries, triggering a dam building race and exacerbating the water challenges. Today, water wars, water wars not in a military sense, but water wars in a political, diplomatic, or economic sense are already being waged between neighboring countries in some regions. In India, even states are fighting over water, whether the states of, of uh, the Kaveri Basin or the states in the north that share the Indus River waters, you have interprovincial disputes in India raging fiercely. A US government report had this warning. This is a report that reflects the joint judgment of American intelligence agencies. This report clearly warned of real water wars, that is water wars in a military sense in the coming years. Water wars in a military sense have actually occurred in our modern world. Water wars are not a theoretical and abstract. You know, they, it's water wars have actually happened in our modern world. To give you just one example of of um, of water wars and how water wars have helped change the water map of a region, look at this particular map. In the early 1950s. China changed the water map of Asia. Yes, the water map of entire Asia by annexing Tibet. Tibet is a very water rich region. It's the world's most water rich region apart from the two poles. Tibet is the starting point of Asia's great rivers that flow to a dozen downstream countries, including to mainland China. With its occupation of Tibet, China is now the world's unrivaled hydro hegemon. No other country in the world 
serves as the riverhead for so many countries. Similarly, in 1967, in a six-day war, Israel changed the water map of the sub-region by capturing the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights is the source of the Jordan River's headwaters and by capturing the aquifer controlling West Bank. So in one stroke, by capturing Golan Heights and West Bank, that too in a six day war, Israel became the water controller of its sub region. Today, water wars are being waged quietly by building dams on international rivers and by resorting to coercive diplomacy. Nothing better illustrates this than the Mekong River. The Mekong River is the lifeline of Southeast Asia. Just before the Mekong River enters Southeast Asia, China has built 11 mega dams, mega dams, is, and is now building more giant dams. Not only is this causing recurrent droughts in the lower basin of the Mekong, but also the downstream countries in Southeast Asia are now virtually at China's mercy. And as you know, that China is now turning its attention to the rivers flowing to India. At the beginning of this month, China unveiled plans to dam the Brahmaputra just before this river enters India. As you can see in this particular map, the Brahmaputra makes a hairpin turn to enter India. And where it makes this hairpin turn, it creates the world's longest and steepest canyon which holds vast quantities of water. That's where China intends to build the world's biggest dam, bigger than even Three Gorges Dam. India's water challenges led the government in 2002, when Atal Bihari Vajpayee was the prime minister, to unveil a plan to link the country's rivers The idea was to even out the vagaries of a monsoon dependent hydrological cycle and to address the unequal availability of water resources. More than 18 years have passed since that plan was unveiled. Yet that river linking plan remains just on paper. Very little action has happened on the ground. Now, let me turn to the larger picture to the, and also look at possible solutions as to how we can address um, this crisis. The first question that arises is, how can the struggle for water be prevented from becoming a tipping point for overt conflict or, for, or from causing seriously disruptive social and economic impacts? The short answer is by establishing at the geopolitical level, norms and institutions to promote rules-based cooperation on shared water resources. And at the community level, by utilizing new technologies and innovative water management. We also need new market mechanisms, public-private partnerships, innovative practices, and conservation. All these things are important. The World Economic Forum publishes an annual global risks report every year. And every year that report has been identifying the water crisis as one of the top global risks. This year's report too says that the water crisis could seriously upset socioeconomic stability, disrupt 
business supply chains, and imperil food and energy production. So what's the way forward? What are the possible pathways? Before I outline the pathways, please remember one thing. Traditional, traditional supply side measures are running into natural limitations because water resources are already overexploited. It's no longer possible in many areas to increase the rate of water extraction from rivers and aquifers because rivers and aquifers are already overexploited. This underscores the imperative to develop non-traditional non -traditional supply sources and management methods. Take the oil and gas sector. What has proved to be a game changer in recent years in oil and gas? It's the tapping of non-traditional, that is unconventional sources, such as shale and tar sands. Likewise, in the water sector, we must explore and develop all unconventional, that is non-traditional options. The unconventional options principally are in three areas. The first is using new technologies to open up new supply sources, including ocean water, brackish water, recycled wastewater, and atmospheric water. These are the four principal non-traditional sources of supply that we can tap. I repeat, ocean water, brackish water, wastewater, and atmospheric water. To tap these new sources of water, the energy intensity of technologies used to be a major concern, a major constraint, in fact. But technological, advantage, uh, technological advancements have substantially improved the energy water ratio, thus increasing the commercial feasibility and attraction of utilizing these new supply sources. Atmospheric water generation, for, uh, of course, is the newest of the new technologies. And atmospheric water generation holds great promise as part of both emergency and long-term supply solutions. The second area centers on achieving greater water use efficiency and productivity through technology and methods that control wasteful practices. In all sectors, whether it's agriculture, industry, or domestic use, there's a lot of wastage of water resource. However, agriculture is the biggest user of water globally, especially in the developing world. Globally, agriculture uses approximately 70% of the freshwater supply. And therefore, the greatest potential for easing the water crisis is through technology and practices that cut the amount of water channeled for farm and livestock production. I say farm and livestock production because we often tend to only look at crop production. We forget that livestock production is a very water intensive business. And I'll just show you one slide so that you can appreciate the water intensity of livestock. Now this particular chart shows the water intensity of meat production. Production of meat on average is about 10 times more water intensive than plant-based calories and proteins. So when people start consuming more and more meat as their income levels rise, this has important implications, both in terms of water availability, as well as 
in terms of the environmental impacts. Livestock production in particular has a very serious impact on the natural environment. And for crop cultivation, micro irrigation systems and other conservation methods can yield major water savings. And the third option, the third pathway is expanding and enhancing the water infrastructure to build distribution efficiency and to correct spatial and seasonal imbalances in water availability. Seasonal imbalances in water availability, for example, can be mitigated by storing water in the monsoon season for release in the dry season. Rainwater harvesting is an ancient technique that originated in Asia, especially in India. In India, this technique was perfected and then went from India to a number of other countries in Asia, especially to Southeast Asia. So to sum up, the era of cheap, bountiful water is over. It has been replaced by increasing supply and quality constraints. The dramatic rise of the bottled water industry attests to this. The bottled water industry has risen only in the last 20 years or so. When I was a student, there was no bottled water, not just in India, anywhere in the world. It shows how dramatically the water situation has changed that bottled water has become so common across the world. Against this background, it's obvious that we need to abandon the business as usual outlook and embrace innovative and cooperative approaches to mitigating the water crisis. Far-sighted investment decisions can turn the water crisis into an engine of innovation and profit. That concludes my presentation and I turn over to Mr. Mathur. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Brahmi for sharing insightful thoughts on the subject. I think you very uh, rightly touched on the fact that water is a finite resource which is one of the most vital of all resources. And we need to look at different alternatives. It is high time that we look at innovative uh, solutions from to enhance the supply of water because there is there are natural limitations when it comes to availability of water. Thank you once again. And uh, now I would like to invite Mr. Richard Reiki, co-founder of Maitri Aquatech and board member of KPMG to give his thoughts on this subject, after which we will have the question and answer session. To give you a, a quick background on Richard, Richard has worked with Arthur Anderson, Ernest and & Young and KPMG, where he has spearheaded the firm in various capacities. He's a qualified chartered accountant in, in India. Besides serving on KPMG Dubai board, where he's helping the Dubai firm in the transformation journey, Richard is also a mentor and angel investor he also mentors startups and young professionals in consulting. Richard is affiliated with leading business enterprises, domestic and worldwide. He's also an active member of diverse industry associations and trade bodies. He's a member of All India Management Association, Board of Governors of the Management and Entrepreneurship and Professional Skills Council. He's a member of Board of Governors Asian School of Business Management and I am Sambalpur. Further, he's also a member of advisory committee board of Smile India uh, uh, and one of the founder members of Wilf Forum in India. Richard has traveled extensively across the globe and is a respected voice on a range of social and economic issues. Richard is not only an articulate and elegant speaker contributing to various public forums and platforms, including TEDs, but he also provides thought leadership through articles in leading newspapers and magazines on diverse topics. 
corporate governance, risk management, leadership, and the economy. I like to invite Richard to share his thoughts on the subject. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Naveen. And uh, uh, I think we had some uh, really good conversations uh, by the two earlier panelists. I think they have laid the ground of where we are on the water issue. And as we all know that whatever is common, people take least care of it. If it is common, it's not owned by me. If it is mine, then I'll take care of it. And in other words, I call it the tragedy of commons. And I think water uh, is uh, the most common resource we have. And I completely agree it's the most undervalued and uh, uh, you know, resource which we have looked at and uh, you know, created our own issues around water. So uh, I think the, the point, I don't want to add any more because already with enough has been said about water, about the challenge issue. I'll just add one, one or two small snippets from my point of view. As much as we have food security, which has become a big item for everybody. And actually during COVID period, I think many countries have woken up uh, to the point of food security. I think water equity also needs, um, we have, the panelists have spoken about it, but I think it's important how we get, uh, you know, the water entitlements to water, the benefits from water use, and how does each person get access to, uh, you know, the water in a similar fashion. Uh, I think it's already been said about food, but, you know, when we consume food, uh, a lot of the uh, food um, we consume uh, it's all made from water because agriculture is the largest consumer. And when we waste food, you can just imagine how much water we are wasting. And it is said that one third of the food globally is being wasted. So basically about nine, uh, uh, that water that is, that food that gets wasted, that water could have been used by nine billion people, and which is more than the population of the world today. And I think it's important uh, that uh, uh, we understand and I think it is not time for just governments and everybody else to come together. And I think for we as individual citizens also need to come together to be disciplined about this very scarce resource, which is hitting different countries at different points of time. I mean, Africa, Middle East are the biggest, um, most stressed countries. Uh, I mean, Professor had shown the chart where he showed the countries which have got water, excess water and those who are having uh, less water, but whatever is excess even now over a period of time gets, um, you know, it goes to different places. So I think uh, I, I just want to uh, say one more thing that I think using water efficiently, being disciplined about it and respecting that, yes, um, why are we wasting something that is so freely available and so underpriced? Uh, because if it was priced differently, I'm sure we would have used it in a very, very different way. So it'll require a big mindset change. It would, um, uh, the water wars is a very clear, I mean, you can already see it being played out uh, across the world. And one is going to see, uh, uh, you know, one of the countries which has done a lot of work around innovation on the agriculture side is a country called Israel. And one can see that how they created out of a desert um, agricultural kind of land and grew, grew, grew crops, et cetera. And also, how do you get down to irrigation using water uh, to the least possible uh, way? And uh, one would have to look at it. It requires a lot of innovation. Uh, the world will need to get smart as far as how do we use water. All of us have a role to play and uh, we cannot, I mean, the time is now, you cannot afford to wait now. And um, uh, Professor touched upon it um, uh, that there are various ways in which this water can be used. And one of the ways uh, which he spoke about was atmospheric water. Um, so there is a new technology, which is the latest technology that has been developed pretty recently, uh, uh, which is called the atmospheric water generators and is one of the methods in which you are able to extract water from the atmosphere and generate into pure drinking water. And uh, this water that is collected is filtered and mineralized and put to various uh, uses. And uh, uh, one of the companies which is working on it is a company in which I'm associated, which is uh, Maitri, uh, which is uh, uh, Maitri Aquatech, which is actually uh, uh, developed, is working on this new technology. Yes, it's a new technology. 
uh, it is uh, uh, and every as comes with every new technology there will be an adoption time and how much it will be able to solve time will only tell uh, i think uh, all the issues around water uh, weight was laid out very clearly but the one or two things i would like to talk about this technology where it can help one is wherever there is an infra infrastructure resource scarcity and natural water availability not being there these machines can actually you know uh, come and be useful there or place where we got high population density and you need the water i mean new buildings when they come up these machines can be put onto the buildings and you can get clean drinking water in your apartment or wherever you live it can be used very much into the medical and healthcare sector uh, the water is required the alkaline water and this this is capable of doing it any large movement of people i'm i'm giving you an example a military movement moving large forces across the country um, and the one of the big things that you need is water and how do you get water in difficult terrains i think this uh, can actually work and the the beauty of these machines are that they can use on electricity they can use on uh, solar and and different alternate paths that are available which it can be used so uh, 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 give you a simple example i mean uh, uh, take a a ship uh, you know to carrying huge uh, uh, cruise liner carrying huge amounts of water because it's out in the sea for the next 20 days or 21 days i mean that can be replaced by these few machines which will be able to generate water and provide clean drinking water or water required for the ship so it will take away a huge amount of space uh used at railway stations public places huge events uh educational institutions factories offices uh, i mean the you i mean the application is huge at the moment and as the technology develops further it may also become a solution to the agricultural sector which is the largest consumer of water and this can actually become because the one big advantage of this water is number one there are no carbon emissions uh, it is 100% pure water which comes out uh, it is there is no ground water so it's actually meeting the so one of the uh, sdg goals of the un uh, and it is environment friendly and i think the more environment friendly it is and it is a uh, it's also a personal source of water i mean because you can have it in your apartment you can have it wherever i mean that water is available to you so i think uh, i think it's important that uh, we, we realize where we live and we all need to become more conscious of the society and the environment which we live in uh, 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 we are the stewards uh, in the spirit of stewardship we've got a planet we need to give it back better than what we got it uh, the one thing you know which people don't realize is uh, this whole uh, this global warming that is happening we feel okay global warming is happening um uh, and if global warming is happening the earth will disappear one day in my view the earth will continue in its being while humans may not be there because new species will emerge history has shown how new species emerge so i think uh, uh, i think we we need to understand that <clears throat> we uh, we need to be conscious i think both the speakers are very eloquent they put all their points together and i do not want to take too much time from the questions etc that may come up or the further inputs that other panel speakers would like to put forward because i think it was a great learning for me at least i learned a number of things from both the speakers so i'm sure all of you are listening and would have also learned a lot of good things uh, with that uh, navin if you can uh, take it back and see if there are any questions we can ask the panel members sure. thanks thanks uh, richard for your thoughts and i think uh, as you rightly put it it is high time that uh, you know globally we start looking at alternatives uh, from existing resources uh, to uh, meet the growing problem of water availability as well as scarcity so moving to the questions we have one question um, uh, can i ask this question to professor brahma please uh, sure. yeah please. yeah water is the new gold and water is being traded on wall street just like oil the prices have doubled in the last one year in california how do you see the market shaping up especially with the challenges being faced in the global south due to climate change what are your views 
Many international investors are beginning to view water as the new oil. And they're looking at how the bottled water industry is now approaching $1 trillion in terms of yearly revenue. And how the bottled water industry has grown so dramatically, its year-by-year -year performance remains outstanding. But there's another one sobering fact that often startles many people. Today, the retail price of bottled mineral water, I repeat, the retail price of bottled mineral water anywhere in the world is higher than the international spot price of crude oil. Now, isn't that shocking that bottled, bottled mineral water retails at a higher price than the spot price of crude oil. Brent crude yesterday closed at about $50 a barrel. One barrel is about 159 liters. So one barrel of crude oil sells cheaper than an equivalent quantity of bottled mineral water. So water is not just heavier than oil. I mentioned in my presentation that water is heavier than oil, but bottled water is also dearer than oil. Against this background, is it any surprise that some international investors or a growing number of international investors are beginning to view water as the new oil? The water-related risks, after all, come with business opportunities. Risk is a major driver of innovation. And when you make investment decisions that are based on on, on uh, far sight, on you know, looking down the road, those decisions can turn risk into an engine of innovation and, and an engine of profit. Thank you, uh, Professor Brahma. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, how would the financing happen, especially for the communities on the other side of the water divide? Would government be the only source or would CSR or other methods emerge? I open it to uh, anyone who would like to answer this question. Yeah, uh, let me take that question, uh, Naveen. So from my point of view, neither the government uh, nor the CSR would finance the water divide or the solution for water divide. The most sustainable and most effective solution is going to be pricing the water. As long as water remains free, you wouldn't be able to adequately fund the infrastructure or resources that will be required to bridge this water divide. If you start pricing the water and that price discovery can happen on these uh, water exchanges, those have been discussed in the earlier uh, Q&A. Uh, based on that uh, water valuation one, uh, you reduce the irrational use of water from various sectors by putting a value to it. And also the funds generated through water pricing, you can use it for various such initiatives. Thank you, Mr. Suhas. Uh, moving on to the third question. In the context of global economic, industrial and population growth in coming years, what do you think will be the role of air as a source of water? Who would like to take this question? Air and what? Sorry, air and? What will be the role of air as a source of water? Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Uh, the question is, in the context of global economic, industrial, and population growth in coming years, what do you think will be the role of air as a source of water? Well, I'm not sure I get the question um, fully. Um, 
but, but there are two issues. You know, one is the population growth mm -hmm. on which um, a lot of attention is focused. Since 1970, the global population has more than doubled. But the global economy has grown 12 fold since 1970. So the main driver of, um, of uh, increasing water use or, or the main driver of water stress is not the demographic expansion, it's the economic expansion. Economic activity is a very water intensive activity. And when we focus on GDP growth, it puts pressure on resources, natural resources, but water in particular, because you need water for anything. You need water for any kind of manufacturing. You need water for, for, for the service sector. So rapid economic growth means greater pressure on, on water resources. Yet the biggest driver, the single biggest driver of water stress in the world is not even is not even economic expansion. It's our changing personal habits. Yesterday's luxuries have become today's necessities. Our personal consumption habits have changed so much that they have driven a situation that has led to increasing water stress. If you look at changing diets, that's the biggest driver of water stress. In Asia, in just one generation, diets have changed dramatically. In China, in Korea, in Southeast Asia, the consumption of meat on a daily basis has grown sharply in just one generation. And the increasing meat consumption means increasing water and resource stress in the world. And this has long-term implications. Today we have, what, 7.8 million people on this planet? Do you know how many livestock there are on our planet at any given time? The most conservative estimate, I say the most conservative because you know the, it's very difficult to, to have a census of livestock, but the most conservative estimate is that we have more than 150 billion livestock at any, at any given time on our planet as compared to 7.8 billion people. Just in the United States, 20 billion livestock are slaughtered every year in just one country. So the 150 billion Livestock figure that I mentioned is a very conservative figure. What it tells us is that the ecological footprint of livestock is much larger than that of humans, even though these livestock are being reared for human consumption. So when people's diets change, they put they, they, this means stress on environment, stress on resources, and stress on water. And that, and yet there is one more factor, if I could you know, complete the full picture. It's the fact that humans are becoming heavier. If you look at the post-World War II trend, obesity, obesity has become a global problem, especially in the West but also becoming a problem in countries where obesity was absent, like China. In the United States, more than one third of the population is now classified as being obese, including one fourth of all children in the United States. According to a study done by a journal in the UK, if everybody in the world had the same profile in terms of body weight, as the Americans, it will be equivalent to adding a billion more people on our planet. So we have several drivers of water stress and mitigating water stress means mitigating 
the stresses on the natural environment because we cannot separate water stress from the stresses on natural environment. We have to take a holistic picture. That's the reason why, at least in terms of government policy, water, energy, and food need to be integrated in a holistic policy framework. Water affects energy, energy affects water. Energy sector is a, is a very water intensive sector. In the developed West, the largest consumer of water is not agriculture. In India and the developing world, it's agriculture. But in Europe and North America, the biggest user of water is energy, the energy sector. So water, energy, and food need to be integrated in a holistic, not be able to get the water situation under control. Let me stop here. I thank, thank you very much, Professor Brahma. Uh, the next question, uh, according to a report by Niti Ayog, some of the major cities in India are expected to run out of groundwater. Similar issues are found in Africa, uh, Middle East, essentially the entire global south. What are the possible solutions to avoid this crisis? To whom is it addressed? Um, it's not been addressed to anyone. Anyone can feel free to give their views. I think I've spoken enough, so I should give my <clears throat> colleagues sure, a chance. Sure. Uh, sure, I would like to <clears throat> address this question. And uh, from my point of view, it's very clear no water crisis, either urban or rural, can be handled without an integrated approach. The cities are running out of water and also the rural areas in India are running out of water or have already run out of water. Uh, as we know, the pipe water supply in the rural part of the country is inadequate. Very, uh, around 50% of the country is approximately covered by efficient tap water supply. And even in these villages, the real situation today is most of the villages in northern Maharashtra, that is Khandesh, MP, Madhya Pradesh, and parts of Telangana and Karnataka don't receive the pipe water or tap water even once in a week. So that would mean that despite having the infrastructure, the supply side issues are preventing us from supplying the water either in rural part or the urban part. How do you handle this problem? You can't just work on one uh, side of the solution. You have to have an integrated solution. One is improving the supplies and there are a number of ways and means to do that, achieve that. And also rationalizing the demand, uh, as Dr. Brahma said, that the lifestyle changes have changed the demand side significantly. And at the same uh, way, agricultural consumption of water has, is becoming unsustainable. So without working on all the three or four parts together, you cannot improve the supply of the water for the cities, for the villages and for the agriculture. And the last point which I would keep repeating is pricing the water or assigning a value to water. As long as water is free or water is underpriced, the issue on supply as well as demand side will continue to be around. If I may just add um, a couple of thoughts, uh, Mr. Mathur, to what Mr. Joshi has said. Uh, groundwater traditionally has been an insurance against drought conditions. But now its rising importance in global freshwater supply has made it, that is groundwater, the world's most extracted natural resource. Users have been exporting groundwater in several regions at rates surpassing nature's recharge capacity. So water tables are falling everywhere. I live in New Delhi and the water table in my city has been falling quite dramatically. And when water tables fall, they cause 
hydrological changes. And the hydrological changes in turn cause ecological effects, including a sharp drop off in flows of many fresh water springs and rivers, and a steady rise of algae in them. Because groundwater is often, groundwater that's the aquifers that hold groundwater are often linked to rivers and to springs. So when we, when we deplete resources in, in aquifers, it has a cascading effect on other ecosystems. About 40% of irrigation globally relies on groundwater, including fossil water. I don't know um, whether Oh, oh, we can't hear you, professors. Down to that level. In, in some parts of the world, irrigation is relying on fossil water. So we have Uh, sorry, Professor, uh, we are unable to hear you. Oh, okay. Um... Uh, now, now, now you're audible. Thank you. Can you please repeat what you were saying? Because uh, you were not audible for some time. His last connection. Okay, I think uh, Professor's lost connection to, till he logs in again. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, what is your view about dark water getting converted into gray and portable water? Cities and towns generate enough dark water. This is especially with the context of India. How do you see this being uh, accepted as a means to meet the po growing portable water requirements of people? Mm -hmm. I think I would leave this uh, question to Navin yourself or Richard, because this is where your expertise also lies. Uh, Mr. Richard, would you like to take this up, please? So, uh, uh, Naveen, I will not be able to answer this, unfortunately, uh, but uh, I would just like to put one point, uh, which is slightly different, uh, because one of the questions that were asked was whether this atmospheric water would be able to replace uh, water as such. And uh, uh, the, like I said, this in my uh, whatever few minutes I had was that uh, it's a very new technology. It has just come in. But all new technologies we have seen where they have gone. If you look at mobiles, mobility in telecom, it changed the way the entire world communicated with each other. Similarly, solar is doing that to power, uh, where one is seeing the solar cost coming down and you know now becoming the alternate to uh, to in the power sector in the grid. And uh, the question comes up: Can AWG actually be that to water? And I think that's something that we have to look at. And as we design these new cities, uh, uh, I know for certain the, the, the Saudi new city that is getting worked on, we are looking at a very smart water solution for that city. And uh, uh, so can AWG be the answer where you can put large uh, uh, installations across the city and make, it, make the whole city much smarter as far as water is concerned? Because uh, we have heard uh, both the speakers talk about depleting water, groundwater, and we all know it. And we, because we have not followed rainwater harvesting, we have not been able to put the water back, what we take out from the land, and that indis indiscipline continues. Uh, so I think we need to find alternate technologies, and I think AWG has come as a new technology. Uh, we have to see whether it can scale up to the level that is required to be scaled up. I think that's the only challenge that has to be tested. 
but it is a solution which is available and i would look at it from that point of view nari sure thanks thanks richard i in fact the next question is about uh, you know uh, it says that how to address the challenges of urban infrastructure in developing countries with regards to water because of the growing uh, challenge of water availability and recycling reuse still being a very limited option see, see what is happening if you look at it uh, you know uh, the, the unfortunate part is uh, the good part of um, a developing country or countries like india is that lifestyles have changed right i mean everybody has become more prosperous and with prosperity comes very different kind of ways of living and uh, uh, i think one of the most important things is that i think uh, sohas has said it two three times or a number of times he said it that water is underpriced it is it is not and you spoke just now you asked a question that uh, water is like gold or what water is like oil and it's got a uh, in fact it's more costly than oil we heard the professor say uh, so i think the 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 point is that we need to put a right value to water but we are so used to getting water almost free that you will just not uh, accept it so i think there has to be an acceptance that water is a scarce resource and you got to pay for it and if you got to pay for it it's it's going to um, and you so one is pricing strategy one is availability of the water one is finding new technologies and innovation using some of the uh, you know because if you look at the whole atmospheric uh, this thing that is there in the atmosphere the the vapor water vapor content it is enough to cover the entire surface of earth with 1 inch of rain water across i mean that much is the kind of content now do we have enough uh, technology available there to actually take this out and and use it uh, for provided drinking water and creating the, the distribution system accordingly so i think while designing these new cities um, um, uh, i at least in the developing countries as we keep talking of these new smart cities everywhere and around the world i think uh, water will play a very very important place and i would also say we are talking of food security we have to talk of equity of water where there is an equitable distribution of water and one has to find ways in which one can actually uh, distribute it it's not an easy answer to get there will have to be a lot of work done on this i would say it's time academia government civil society everybody gets to get gets together because it is a crisis tearing us in the face it's not a crisis coming down the road the crisis is here we are in the middle of the crisis and the quicker we do it uh, i mean we saw in covid right we were all sitting at home the atmosphere suddenly the, the whole environment changed uh, so i think if we become uh, we use what we have in a more disciplined way i think we would create a, a better environment for ourselves right yeah navin right thank you thank you richard for your thoughts i think uh, with that uh, uh, we'll end this webinar thank you very much to all the panelists as well as the participants what we will do is we will also this webinar would be available also on youtube and uh, we are looking forward to many more such webinars uh, which will happen on a periodic basis wherein we will get people from industry academia government to bring their share their thoughts on water thanks once again for your time and all the very best thank you thank you thank you, thank you very thank much you. bye right